Jude begins his epistle, as he begins it there in chapter 1, which or chapter 1, verse 1, of course, which we've already read, by talking about the believer. Now, Jude's epistle is actually an epistle for contending for the faith. It's an epistle against apostasy, false teachers. And one of the things that he wants to make sure that we understand is our, our eternal security. That doctrine, it, it runs wild today in the church. That you can lose, somehow lose your salvation. That somehow uh, the grace of God and the blood of Christ is not enough to keep you saved. It, it can save you, but it can't keep you saved. And so we've got that issue that we work with. There are churches here in this town. We could point to them that believe this, that you know, grace might save you, but it's not enough to keep you saved. You are in responsibility, or you're responsible for keeping your salvation. Your eternal security lies in your ability to keep yourself saved. That's a terrifying thought, isn't it? It's terrifying to me that I, somehow I have within me that which keeps me saved. Last week we talked about, or week before last, we saw how, of what a wretched person we are, right? How wretched I am, Paul said. 28 years after his conversion, he cried that out. Oh, wretched man that I am, who will save me from this body of death? Of course, he gave that to Christ. But here, because we are called, if you'll notice in verse 1, Jude, a bondservant of Jesus Christ, and brother of James, to those who are called, beloved in God the Father, and kept for Jesus Christ. So, because we are called, we are therefore sanctified. This is what Jude is teaching us. And because we are sanctified by God the Father, we are preserved in Jesus Christ. To be called or to be sanctified is also to be preserved in Jesus Christ. That all goes together. The NASB, the NASB if you have an ANSB, if you're reading from the NASB, the, instead of the word preserved, it'll use the word kept. If you have an NASB, you'll see that there, the word kept. It's the same word as preserved. It means the same thing. In fact, Peter reiterates this. He says this as well in 1 Peter chapter 5. You don't have to turn there. You can if you want to. But he said that we're kept by the power of God. I like that. Not kept by the power of Albert. Kept by the power of God. How powerful is God? How powerful is God? He's all-powerful. That's right. He is all-powerful. Whatever that means. He's, he's demonstrated that all-powerfulness by creating the universe simply by speaking it into being. He spoke it into being. Is there anything that you can do to speak it into being? No. He's all-powerful. He can do that. We're kept by that power, that power that spoke the world into being, that power that... Raised the Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, from the dead. That same power that gave life to the dead. And sight to the blind. And forgiveness to the sinner. We're kept by the power of God. And most know this teaching as the doctrine of eternal security. And, and our eternal security is secure because our salvation, as we've seen there, is in Jesus Christ. The power of God, Jesus Christ. I'm not uh, remiss by saying that, am I? That we're kept by the power of God, Jesus Christ, for he is God, right? We are drawn by the Spirit, and that drawing is granted by the Father. John 6 tells us that. We are sanctified by God the Father, thus kept in Jesus Christ, or preserved in Jesus Christ. I don't see anywhere in the Scriptures that man is involved with our security of salvation at all. He is not. Where these Armenians, if you will, not Calvinists, but Armenians get that theology, I don't know, but they don't get it from the Scripture. They don't. Salvation, then, is all of God, and if so, how could it not be, how could it not be secure? If it is of God, if it's kept by the power of God, how can it not be secure? How could you not sit here today and know that your salvation is eternal, eternally secure? Amen? 
It's a fact. It's a biblical truth. That's what Peter meant when he said, who are kept by the power of God. Kept by the power of God. You know, when you, you know, flash your mind back, back when Leroy Jackson was here. Had you, had you ever shaked his hand? Had you ever sh- shook his hand? Those of you who were men, I don't know if he, I don't know how he shook the women's hands, but man, when he shook a man's hand, man, it was just. <laughs> Same way? Okay. Jeez. I remember thinking, I'm not shaking his hand anymore. That's power. That's, I, I just couldn't believe how much power was in that, that man's hand. But he was, a, he was a blacksmith, worked the hammer and the anvil. He had this powerful, unbelievable, strong grip. Even big guys like Mike Orman's big hand, you're, he could crush that one. Power, strength, powerful grip, hold. And that's a human strength. God is infinitely more powerful. There's no greater power anywhere, seen or unseen, than the power of God. No greater power. If we're kept by His power, then we are secure in our salvation, or we are preserved in Jesus Christ. If if God planned to call us, which Jude says He did, God planned to call us to Himself, if he planned to sanctify us, which he does, it makes perfect sense that he planned to keep us. He planned to keep us. How many of you have, how many of you have possessions at home that you, when you got them, you planned to keep them? And no matter what, you will not get rid of them, right? And you won't, any, won't let anybody take them away from you either, right? How many of you have these, uh, these uh, annual or biannual house cleanings where you gather up all your junk and you either give it away or sell it at a yard sale? There's that one thing that my wife keeps trying to get rid of that I own. <laughs> I keep finding it out there. What's this doing out here? I go and get it and put it back. When that was given to me, I decided way back then that I was going to keep that. And even my wife's devious plans can't take it from me. Yeah. That's what this is. If he planned to call us and he planned to sanctify us, it makes sense that he planned to keep us. He's planned to keep us. Turn with me to John 17, 12, if you will. John 17, 12. I know, these, these wives can be pretty sly about getting rid of those old tennis shoes that you've had for forever, you know, that probably should have been thrown away, but you're not going to get rid of them. John seventeen twelve. while I was with them in the world, I what? I kept them in you, in your name. Those whom you gave me, I have kept, and none of them is lost except the son of perdition, that's Judas, that the scriptures might be fulfilled. So he uses that word kept twice there. That's important. I'm going to keep these. These are, these are keepers. We say that. We use that language, huh? She's a keeper, or he's a keeper, or they're a keeper. We're a keeper to the Lord. He has planned to keep us. He has. And this verse goes right along with what Jude says. The words of Jesus affirm or qualify the words of Jude and vice versa. I wonder where Jude got his theology. He got it from the Lord. That's where he got his theology. He got it from the apostles. The apostles themselves, Jude himself, they all got it from the the Lord. John 17, 12 says that we are kept or preserved and that we are preserved in Jesus Christ. And the Lord uses that word kept twice there. So that adds emphasis emphasis to his claim concerning his preserving power over the saints. Turn with me to John 10. John 10. We should be flashing these up on the screen. Yeah, there you go. Can you see that? I'm not that tall, am I? I might wish I was, but... John 10, 27 and 28. There you go. Is that helpful to have that up on the screen like that? 
Okay, good. I forgot to do it last time, and Carol reminded me how helpful it was. My sheep hear my voice. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them. Consequently, they follow me. Look what it says. I give them eternal life, and they shall never, say that out loud, they shall never what? Shall never perish. Never perish. Do you see that? Let's make that clear. My sheep hear my voice. I know them, and they follow me, and I give them eternal life. I give them eternal life. You know the gospel, right? Salvation is a gift of God, not of works. He says it. I give them eternal life, and they shall never. You guys are missing that cue. They shall. There you go. Neither shall anyone. It's just like my wife trying to hide my favorite pair of shoes over over. She tries anyone. All right. Neither shall anyone snatch them out of my hand. My father, who is given to me, is what? What is he? Yeah, that's what Peter meant. Kept by the power of God. He is greater than all. There's no one greater and no one more powerful than God. No one is able to snatch them out of my father's hand. And so these verses qualify both Peter's words in 1 Peter, who are kept by the power of God, and Jude's words in Jude 1, preserved in Jesus Christ or kept in Jesus Christ. And both speak of God the Father's power to preserve his sheep and the Lord's power to keep them safe and secure in the fold of salvation. In the fold of salvation. You are in the fold of salvation. If you were sheep, you'd have a, you would have a, a, a brand on you that said saved in the fold of salvation. And this verse reveals, this verse here reveals seven truths and reliable realities, this verse we're looking at here, about our salvation that binds every true Christian to God forever. So let's consider that. I'm going to give you seven of them. We're going to go through them rather quickly. First, we are his sheep. We belong to him. That's what he says. My sheep hear my voice. So we are his sheep. We belong to him. There are other sheep out there. There are other sheep out there, but they're not his sheep. They belong to the devil. We are his sheep. We hear his voice. I love that. When I first became a Christian, Believe it or not, when I first became a Christian, because of the presence of the Holy Spirit in my life, before I ever learned any real doctrine, before I learned any doctrine or theology, I was able to determine truth from error when I heard it. I believe that was because I am his sheep, and I know his voice. I used to listen to Christian radio, and I could hear some of it that was error, and I knew what I, I would say, that's not right. <laughs> that doesn't sound like the voice of my Lord. And then I would hear that which was correct and sound. And I'd say, that is truth. And Jesus only speaks truth. So we are his. We belong to him. He bought us with his blood. It was a known fact in those days that it was the sole responsibility of a good shepherd to keep their sheep close and secure. The good shepherd kept his sheep safe and secure. John said, let's turn to John 6, 39. Let's turn there for just a minute. John 6, 39. We're going to be in John a, lit, a lot for the next few minutes. John 6, 39, this is the will of the Father who sent me, that of all he has given me, I should lose how many? None or nothing, but should raise it up in the last day. It makes no sense to insist that a Christian can lose his salvation if the Lord has declared that he will lose none. Right? Believing that defames his character and his competence 
as a good shepherd. It implies that he's unable to hold on to us, thus entrusted. Jesus tells us that his that our salvation was entrusted to him by the Father. And God wouldn't entrust anything to anyone if it wasn't worthy of that. Second, number one, we are his sheep and we belong to him. Second, his sheep hear only his voice and follow only him. That is that's the implication there. My sheep hear my voice and they follow me. Christians follow the voice of God. That is the word of God. The living word of God, Jesus Christ. Turn with me to John 10. John 10. So, first, we are his sheep. We belong to him. Second, his sheep only hear his voice and only follow him. John 10, 25, or excuse me, 2 through 5. But he who enters by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. To him the doorkeeper opens, and the sheep hear his voice, and he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. And when he brings out his own sheep, he goes before them, and the sheep follow him. Why? For they know his voice, yet they will by no means, what? Follow a stranger. You guys are missing those cues. <laughs> but will flee from him, for they do not know the voice of strangers. This also speaks of eternal security. It tells us that we're kept by the power of God, the voice of God, the word of God. This passage reminds me of Peter's words in John 6, 68. He says, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. I love that passage. Where am I going to go, Lord? Are you also going to go away? Where am I going to go? Where are we going to go, Lord? You have the words of eternal life. We want nothing more. We need nothing more. We desire nothing more. We follow nothing more. But the words of eternal life. Since the Lord's sheep know only his voice and will not follow a stranger but run away, they could not possibly wander away from the Lord and be eternally lost. That is the implication in the passage. They will not. Third, the Lord's sheep have eternal life. John 10, 27 tells us that, we already read, that I give eternal life to them and they shall never perish. And so the Lord's sheep have eternal life. To think of eternal life ending is a contradiction in terms. Is that right? Is that right? Is that simple logic? To think of eternal life, being able to end, is a contradiction in terms, isn't it? If it can end, it's not what? It's not eternal life. It's not. Fourth, the verse speaks of Christ giving eternal life. John 10, 27 and 28. We already looked at that. The sheep did nothing to earn it, so they can't do anything to lose it. Fifth, Jesus promised that they will never perish. We looked at that really directly a few moments ago. Listen, what do you call someone who makes a promise and then doesn't keep it? What do you call someone who promises and then, and then just doesn't keep it? What would you call that person? Yeah, that's right. Someone said it. Yeah. Uh, uh, not a promise keeper? Yeah. A liar. He said he was, gonna, he was going to do something. Don't you feel like that when someone promises you something and they break the promise? Don't you, make, don't you feel like they are a, yeah, that's how you feel. You lied to me. Jesus tells the truth always. Eight, John 8, 45. He always tells the truth. And he said, I give eternal life to them and they shall never perish. That's a promise. It's an ironclad promise from God himself through his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Never perish. If he doesn't keep that promise, he's a liar. If he's a liar, he's not God. Because God cannot lie, the scripture says, right? Six, no one is able to snatch them out of the Father's hand, not even you. I always hear that from those who don't believe in eternal security, who, don't, who want to say that there was a, there's a level of sin that I could commit that would keep me from from. I mean, cause me to lose my salvation. They say, well, yeah, God holds you in his hand, 
and nobody else can snatch you out, but you can snatch yourself out. Come on, how ridiculous is that? Yeah, that's, how ridiculous is that? I can jump out of God's hand? That's not very powerful, is it? It's not. So no one is able to snatch him out of his hand. No, no false prophet? No false shepherd? No fa- Haven't you guys ever seen a woman with a baby? You guys are all watching her like, wow, a woman with a baby. I've never seen that before. I mean, you just saw uh, Whitney walk that direction with her baby, and you guys were all watching her. Okay, let's all stop and watch the women go by with their babies. Listen, no false prophet, no false shepherd, no false doctrine. It's all implied in the scripture. Not even Satan. It would probably be the most second powerful being in the world besides Christ. No man has more power than the devil. No human government has more power than the devil. But he has, his power pales in comparison to God's. Because he's a created being. He was created by God. He can't create anything. He can't create anything. He's never created anything. The only thing he never create is a lie. He's the one you can't trust. And he's the author of all false doctrine and all lies. Not even Satan. Let me say it again. No false prophet, no false shepherd, no false doctrine, not even Satan, no one can snatch you out of the Father's hand. As Jesus declared in John 10, 30, I and my Father are one. One in nature, one in essence. They preserve the saints for eternity. 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 It was declared in eternity's past, and it will go on into eternity's future. Seventh, as I said before, Jesus, both Jesus and the Father, jointly guarantee the security of the believer's salvation. So, not only that, but as we turn back to Jude, notice, if you will, go back to Jude. Notice in Jude 24, Jude 1, 24, there's only one chapter in Jude. So I could, I could, I could basically just give you the verse, but so, so that I don't confuse you, let me give you the chapter too. I'll say Jude 24, and one of you will say, what chapter? Right? Notice what he says, now, to him who is able to what? Keep you from stumbling. Stumbling has the connotation of falling, or in other words, stumbling precedes a fall. You stumble and then you fall. Okay? And present you what? Isn't that wonderful? I don't know if you have an NASB or not, but faultless is an incredible term. Faultless. What's that mean? Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Without fault, faultless, sinless, guiltless, uncondemnable. That's what that means, faultless. Before the presence of his holy glory with exceeding joy. You know, I I know when, when the Lord presents us as faultless because of the work that he has done, when he presents us to the Father, with all that glory and faultlessness and sinlessness and righteousness, yeah, oh yeah, he's going to be overjoyed. It's going to be way greater than when you watch your child graduate from high school, right, or from college. You're just so, ha, oh, ha, I'm so proud. It's way beyond that. Way beyond that. Exceeding great joy. Again, Jude assures them and us of eternal security. And I believe that part of what Jude defends in the epistle had to do with teaching that said, you can lose your salvation. He's defending that. He's contending for the faith. It said eternal security is eternal. That's what it means. Salvation is forever. That's what Christ taught. And he guaranteed it by his blood. And that's why he starts out with their position in Christ. The Father called them, he sanctifies them, and he keeps them in Christ. 
He keeps them in Christ. The Lord is able to keep you from falling away from Him. And to do what? To present you faultless. That, that's, that's the sanctification that we looked at a while back. It does us no good to limit God. He designed it. He planned it. He's going to see it through to completion. Turn with me to Philippians 1, 6. Philippians 1, 6. Turn with me there. Philippians 1, 6. Many of you know this by heart. It may be one of your favorite life verse. It is one of mine. It became one of mine years ago when I was working this doctrine out in my own mind. Being confident of this very thing, that he who began a good work in you will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. So the Lord started it. He's going to finish it concerning your salvation. Turn with me to Hebrews chapter 12, 2. Hebrews 12, 2. Just the first part, okay? I'll give you a second to get there. It's in the middle of the New Testament. That's kind of how I do it. Hebrews 12, 2. Looking unto Jesus, what? There's your cue, what? The author and of our faith. Author means what? The one who started it, right? The one who wrote it. The creator, Okay. The author, or creator, or writer, the starter, and he's also the, who finishes your faith? You? He does. He planned it, he'll finish it. He's working it all out. Everybody, even where you're at right now, he is working it all out. All right, God works all things out for good. So with these promises, why should we ever be concerned about our eternal security? It's kept by the power of God. It's preserved in Jesus Christ. The concern should be whether we're saved or not. That's the concern. Are we saved? Are we truly saved? I'd be more concerned about that than whether my salvation is secure or not. Because you can't argue eternal security. You can try, but you can't. Whether you're saved or not. That's arguable. That's arguable. But once we're saved, we can be sure it's forever. Not because I'm saying it, but because God has said it. Now, kept or preserved, what does it mean? Well, the Greek, the Greek form is to guard. It has the idea, the idea of keeping watch over something. Shepherds would do that, right? They would watch, keep, keeping watch over their flocks by night. So they're keeping watch over it. The Lord is keeping watch over our salvation. He is the shepherd, right? It's like a, kind of like a lifeguard on the beach. He's there to do what? What's the lifeguard there to do? Preserve life. That's why he's there. He's there to keep you safe. To preserve life. And that's why he carries with him a life preserver. And the same idea is being used in the verse. Without the lifeguard, your chances of death increase dramatically. Those of you who swim after dark in the ocean when the lifeguard's not there, you put yourself at an incredible, great, incredibly greater risk if something were to happen to you out there in the dark ocean. Jesus is like our spiritual lifeguard who was there to watch over our salvation and keep it safe. If he wasn't there, we would be in danger of losing it. Do you remember the parable? Remember the, not the parable, but remember the scene when they're in the boat? They're all in the boat. Remember that? They're all in the boat. And the Lord is asleep in the boat, exhausted and asleep. And a storm comes up, and it's crashing. Terrible storm. And it's probably the worst they've ever seen because they are terrified out of their mind. And one of them runs over and says, Lord, don't you care that we perish? And he gets up and says, oh, you of little faith. Why do you suppose he says that? Oh, you of little faith. Why do you think he says that? Do you think they would have perished 
as long as he was in the boat? Do you think the boat would have sunk and crashed and they would have all drowned, including Jesus? Do you think that? Do you literally think that? Do you think they were in danger of dying as long as he was in the boat? That's Jude's point. Our uh, salvation isn't just preserved, it's preserved in who? In Christ. Now what about Jesus Christ? Why is that so important? Why is that so important? Well, would you rather have your salvation preserved or dependent upon you or some other human? Or some vain philosophy? So it means just that. Eternal security means just that. That's what it means. It's not dependent on any other source than the one who brought it about, the one who has eternal life in him. And that's Jesus Christ. That's why it's so secure. And for the record, who is Jesus Christ anyways? Who is he? Well, before we go, let's go to Matthew 16. Matthew 16. This is why Jude said, you're kept in Jesus Christ. You're not kept in Paul. You're not kept in Jude. You're not kept in Peter. No, no man other than the man, Christ Jesus. No religion can keep you safe. No religion can save you. Christ alone. Matthew 16, 13 through 17. When Jesus came into the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, saying, Who do men say that I am? The Son of Man. So they said, Some say John the Baptist. That's pretty good. Some say Elijah. That's pretty good. Another say Jeremiah, one of the prophets. They didn't know. He said to them, But who do you say that I am? And Simon Peter answered and said, You are the Christ. You're not John the Baptist, you're not Elijah, you're not Jeremiah, you're not one of the prophets, you're the Christ. You're the son of the living God. And Jesus answered and said to them, Blessed are you, Simon Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. Remember, that's an important point that Jesus made to Peter. You're not smart enough to figure that out on your own. If you were left to yourself, you would not know who I am. That's what he's saying. You would not know who I am. God the Father has revealed my identity to you. That's actually biblical salvation. God reveals you the identity of Christ. Without God's hand in it, you will never know who he is. You will never fully understand who he is. There's a lot of people out there and a lot of religions out there saying who he is. But if they're not saying who he is according to the way the scripture says he is, it's not a work of the Father. It's a false teaching. And how do you know false religion? Because they always have something to say about Jesus that is totally different than what this book has to say. You are Christ. You are the Son of the living God. And this is the confession of all time. And it is a true statement or it is a lie. And look, Peter, or the Lord made no attempt to correct Peter, right? In fact, he affirmed his confession. He says, you are blessed, Peter. You are blessed because God has opened your eyes to this reality. Jesus is the son of the living God. And because he is, he is also God in human form. And that's where your salvation is kept. It's kept in Christ, the son of the living God. And that's the key to salvation. That is the key to securing salvation. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. Jesus said, if you do not believe that I am he, you will die in your sins. Acts 4.12 says, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which men must be saved. Cannot be saved under 
uh, no other name except the name of Christ, the Lord Jesus Christ. And this is why Jude refers to our calling, our salvation, our sanctification as preserved or kept in Jesus Christ. His sacrificial death, death on the cross for the remissions of sins. Jesus brought that about. The Lord did. So all the glory goes to him. Because our salvation has been made sure, kept, secure, preserved forever and ever and ever. And this truth, according to Jude, is worth defending. That's, that's what he does in his epistle. He defends this truth right off the bat. Let's pray. Your heads bowed and eyes closed. Romans 8, 38 and 39 says this, For I am convinced that neither death nor life nor angels nor principalities nor things present nor things to come nor powers nor height nor depth nor any other created thing will be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Over and over again in Christ Jesus. Father, thank you so much for the assurance of our salvation. Thank you so much for the security of our salvation. Thank you for reminding us this morning that there is no pit. There is no pit too deep where your grace can't get there. There is no sin too great that your great grace can't forgive. And there is no sin, no sin, that would ever cause us to lose our salvation. Except the only one, which is to reject your free offer of salvation. That's the only sin, to reject the offer of forgiveness, to reject the gospel, to reject the offer of Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. If you're here today with your heads bowed and your eyes closed and you're not 100% sure that you're in the fold of salvation, and you can make sure by simply asking the Lord, forgive me, Lord. Help me to make sure. Save me. Let my salvation be in Christ, in Christ alone, not a religion. I, I refuse all religion. I walk away from all religion. I, re I refuse any kind of thinking or ideology or any of that, which prescribes itself as the means of salvation other than Jesus Christ in Christ alone. We fully and completely trust in that, in him alone, for our forgiveness, for our calling, for our sanctification, and for our security of our salvation in Christ and Christ alone. Father, thank you for the blessing of your word today. In Jesus' name.